With his siege towers now complete, Xanthippus readied himself for the assault of Sinope. As he and his men prepared, a small fort intruded his mind. That perhaps the size of his force was a little bit overkill. Armored hoplites scaled the towers that had made the journey to the undefended wall of Sinope with little effort. With no one opposing them, the hoplites made quick work of capturing the city's defences and, ultimately, the gates, allowing for the militia cavalry to charge right through and participate in the capture of the city for quite possibly the first time in the Greeks' campaign so far. Racing onto the plaza, the militia collide with the Peltasts, and while losing a few of their own horsemen, they cut through the Pontic men with little effort. A javelin takes down the captain, and the rest of Sinope's garrison suffer his fate as well. A hail of javelins ending it all too quickly. The not long since riotous people of Sinope were none too pleased with Xanthippus' arrival, so he had most of the population slaughtered. Clearly, the newly captured city would not sit idly if Xanthippus were to take his force and leave, so the moment Antilochus had been waiting for had arrived. To the east, still grieving over the loss of his father, it was time for Aemnestos to finish what he and his father started. The rams were ready, and while the forces of Hatra had nothing to do with Hero's death, Aemnestos was ready to blame them for it anyway. Pathetic eastern infantry made the bulk of the city's garrison and a portion of the reinforcements, but it did not matter for Aemnestos had command of the most elite soldiers Greece had ever produced, and he was ready to make Dionysus the killer into Dionysus the killed. Spartans, backed by Cretan archers, set up the rams before the northern and eastern gates. The battle began and the rams begin their journey to their respective gates, all while creeping from the west came the reinforcements. If they were wise, they would stay there. The Cretans were efficient in their removal of the Pontic forces that fought to defend the gates as the rams approached. Bodies lined the streets and the gates hadn't even been busted open yet. With both gates now open, the Spartans flood into the streets. Any opposition was quickly thwarted by the Cretan archers. But the Spartans would need to move faster. It seemed that wisdom was not on the tables for the Pontic reinforcements. A shame. The Eastern Spartans were making good progress through the town, cutting down and breaking all who opposed them. The northern team steadily filed into the city, though soon they found themselves facing a team of chariots that had raced ahead of the reinforcements. The Spartans dealt with them with very little effort on their part. Chariots on one side and a charging general's unit on the other, while Sanzes was clearly lacking the wisdom as well as he charges his bodyguard into the wall of Spartans. The chariots were gone, and so too was Farfanzes, and from over the hill Dionysus and his force steadily approached. The Spartans moved with haste to block the broken gates, protecting our advancing comrades from potential chariots to the rear. With the flanks protected, the flood under the plaza began. Hundreds of red-cloaked Spartans pushed through the square and the helpless bronze shields. The Pontic men falling beneath the Spartans with ease, Surely the elite of the Pontic forces would put up a little more of a fight. But it appeared that today would not be that day for the bronze shields are quickly removed from the town, and the time to victory began. Though the Spartans must hurry if they're going to defend the streets from the reinforcements in time, the hoplites filled the streets their spears down and ready for the enemy's advances, the men backed by the trusty archers that held the town centre. The wave of eastern infantry and mercenaries finally came into contact with the Spartans. The Pontic men tired and already wavering, and their archers could do nothing to get past the Spartans' armour. The weak infantry were no challenge for the Spartans, and the men were quickly dealt with, with minimal losses. Only two more Pontic units remained, which quickly turned to one as the southern eastern infantry broke immediately once coming into contact with Greek spears. The Spartans took the men down without a sweat and were ready for the next and final wave of opposition. The exhausted infantry raced towards the town centre that they were commanded to protect. They had seconds to make it. But alas, they failed, though the Greeks were willing to give them a fair chance and allowed the battle to continue, for it most certainly wasn't so the Spartans could shred through the last remaining men like they were wet tissue paper. Regardless of the reasoning, the battle continued and the last Pontic men fell beneath Spartans, and the town of Hatra now belonged to the Greeks. Now lacking the skilled surgeons that had passed with Hero, significantly fewer of the elite men recovered from their injuries. The progressing age of the warriors surely mustn't be helping either. 
The small desert town had barely any population and they seemed happy enough with Aenestos' occupancy. And with no local mercenaries to hire, the small town would have to wait for caravans of peasants from the nearby cities before Aemnestos would be happy to leave it. While Aemnestos would be stationary for a while, his agents would not be, heading south for Palmyra. During the summer of 214 BC, Nicodromos advances closer to Antioch, hoping that the city would hold out and the Egyptians hold off until he got there. To the west, Epigeus steadily makes his way east to join his family in conquering the east. And Antilochus gets ever closer to Sinope to relieve Xanthippus. With the infrastructure of the city now repaired, Xanthippus' forces could now be retrained. Near Hatra, a Pontic general showed his face, and Damastor, eager for his next kill, immediately swooped in and eliminated the man. And Damian the spy infiltrates Palmyra, finding a single general defending the town. A little to the west, agents begin to infiltrate Jerusalem, ready for Dimas's eventual arrival. During the transition from summer to winter, Campus Yazagas comes under siege, though not from the expected party. The British betrayal was to be expected, but perhaps not this soon. Captain Praesitargus did not appear to have fought ahead with his besiegement force, bringing with him mostly missile chariots. With Antilochus now in range of the city, Xanthippus was finally ready to leave Sinope and begin his travels south. Nicodromos marched his army to the northern gates of Antioch, ready to reinforce the city in their hour of need. With the troops in place, the peasants of Antioch engaged the Egyptians, but quickly found that Nicodromos was still out of reach. A messenger was able to sneak out of the city and inform the general of the predicament. Nicodromos repositioned to attack the Egyptian army, and both he and the citizens of Antioch hoped that the Egyptians would hold off once more. To the north, Ducitius was ready to fend off the British army. While Campus Yazagas mostly fielded peasants, the city still contained four units of Cretan archers and militia cavalry. The Cretans were lined up along the walls of Campus Yazagas, firing down on the manoeuvring Brits. Hours rained down on the vulnerable chariots, taking down a few as they passed by. With the Britons now out of the way, the militia cavalry could leave the city. Chosen swordsmen attempt to charge the light cavalry, but the Cretans are quick to make them regret their decision. Deciding to cut their losses, the Britons began their retreat, and the militia cavalry chased them down, charging into the missile infantry, cutting down as many as they could before the Brits left the battlefield. While well, the militia may have broken the end, they had still done their job. The Brits had lost the battle, leaving with just over half of the troops they came with. The militia cavalry may have suffered heavy losses, but Deseatus could retrain them and recruit more, ready for the next inevitable attack from the Brits. The gods, it appeared, were on Nicodromos' side as the Egyptians had waited once more, and the young general was able to engage with the besiegers. The Egyptians were surrounded. Cretans were already firing down on the Egyptian infantry as the chariots split off for the forces of Antioch. The Bedouin archers didn't last long against the heavy chariots and the Arab cavalry quickly follow in the retreat. The peasants charged into the chariots and while the peasants fell like dominoes, their bodies were clogging up the chariots in the deadly skies, allowing the next wave of peasants to attack. It took time and persistence, but the peasants emerged victorious, producing a unit of 46 to 4. The desert cavalry would be the peasants' next victim, and it appeared that their valiant victory over the chariots was enough to send the Egyptians retreating from the field. The Greeks chased down the cowardly Egyptians, Nicodromos taking down any of the struggling infantry, until none remained. What remained of the Egyptians retreated to the south, and having been under siege for so long, Antioch was understandably upset, and so Nicodromos took up occupancy of the city. In Palmyra, it was discovered that the measly general that was defending the town was in fact the faction leader, and while he only had a 17% chance of success, Damastor could not turn up an opportunity like this. Even if he failed, surely an agent of his calibre would be able to get away. Oh. 
But while the gods were watching over Nicodromos, the same could not be said for Damastor. And after a long string of successful assassinations, the master assassin had gone to Hades. From summer to winter, the Gaul decided that they still hadn't given up on their ambition to get into Greek lands. The Armatoplites raced us around their end of the bridge, their spears falling in time for the first wave of warband to run right into them. The archers and militia cavalry lined up behind the Hoplite horde, firing down on the densely clustered Gaul crossing the bridge. The Gaul infantry stood no chance against the Hoplite spears on all sides, some breaking as soon as they came into contact. Some of the Gaul tried to swim across the river, not realising that they had yet to gain that ability and would not gain it for another 576 years. The captain goes down and the Gaul forces begin the retreat, and while the Gaul's backs are exposed, the Greeks take advantage and chase down the running barbarians. The horde of cavalry easily take down the remaining Gaul infantry, and while the Gaul had been able to kill three Greeks, it was found that eleven had died during the battle. Epigeus continues his journey east to Mazaka, and with just enough peasants now trained up, Dimas was finally able to leave Sidon and advance on Jerusalem, building his three siege towers. And finally, Xanthippus continues his way south. The turn ends and an Egyptian army takes offence to Dimas holding their city under siege and attacks. He brought with him some formidable units in the pharaoh's bowmen and spearmen as well as onagers, but his downfall would no doubt be through the copious amount of mercenaries in his army. Dimas was surrounded on both sides, the reinforcements of Jerusalem directly behind him and the forces of Tutankhamun Wee stretching out before him. He orders half of his militia cavalry and the elephants to deal with the Jerusalem army. The rest of the militia cavalry begin harassing the main ranks of the Egyptian army. The militia and elephants had been doing a wonderful job of dealing with the Jerusalem force, but the Egyptians had been able to send the elephants berserk, and while the great beasts were still taking out the enemy, the panicked animals were easy to take down. Three units remained for the militia to take down. In the meantime, the main Greek force advanced into the main Egyptian army, the artillery strikes thankfully missing them as they went. Spearmen meet spearmen and the battlefield was chaos. The militia cavalry, now freed from dealing with the Jerusalem army, were sent to deal with the onagers. The Greek hoplites were steadily making their way through the Egyptians, but the rocks from the onagers certainly did not help in keeping the casualties low. The Egyptians were beginning to flee, but the Greeks' numbers were steadily falling. The militia cavalry made contact with the onagers, and surrounded by their retreating fellows, the onager crew were quick to follow. The hoplites were surrounded, but they too surrounded the Egyptians. Using their struggling numbers, the Greeks picked away at each of the Egyptians' units, the archers supporting from the rear. The Egyptians were fleeing, but so too were the Greeks. Mostly missile infantry remained, and what was left of the hoplites and Dimas advanced and charged. The Egyptians crumbled beneath the Greeks, and soon not many remained. The chariots of Jerusalem still remained though, and the archers were happy to deal with the tired horsemen. Reduced and fling, the archers were able to take out the captain. 
They turned their attention back to the main Egyptian force. Two Egyptian units remained, Bedouin archers and Pharaoh's bowmen. The Bedouins quickly broke at the sight of Diamas's approach, and the bowmen followed shortly behind. Diamas refused the call of surrender and vowed to take down each of the remaining Egyptian men, and take them down he did until a singular bowman remained. Diamas came charging down from atop the hill, the bowman trying to run and escape, shouting in fear. Diamas misses on his first pass, taking their time, the cavalry turn around and advance on the bowman. And with great precision, a member of the general's bodyguard strikes the bowman in his back, crumpling his spine and sending him to the ground. The battle was won, yes, but not without substantial losses, though at the very least none of the units had been fully lost. Daimas may have won that battle, but the war was not yet over. A second Egyptian army attacked the weakened Daimas. The Greek general was well and truly outnumbered, but the Egyptians fielded basic lads. The odds were one to one and the battle could go either way. The Egyptians' line stretched out wide and ready to wrap around the Greeks. The militia cavalry advanced on each flank, ready to harass and hopefully break the Egyptians' flanks. The elephants joined the forward advance, and when they got into the right position, the elephants charged right through the desert axemen, sending men flying through the air and breaking the unit. The elephants moved onto the Nubian spearmen, all well being showered by flaming garrows. As they tossed spearmen around, a stray tusk hit the captain of the Egyptian force. With the main line disrupted enough now, the elephants moved their focus to the bowmen. Their flaming arrows are real risks to the elephants' morale. But just as the beasts were about to begin their charge, the bowmen released one last volley of flaming arrows, and it was enough to send the elephants running in fear. The troops that the elephants had once so easily merged through took down the great beasts, and with a cheer from the Egyptians, the last elephant fell, burned to a crisp. The rest of the Greek army remained safely at the top of the hill, waiting for the Egyptians' advance. The rain of archer fire was enough to send most of the Egyptians retreating, and militia cavalry, now out of javelins, raced down the hill and into the bowmen that had been picking off the Spartans. The militia had been cutting through the bowmen with success, but something changed and the cavalry were sent retreating. The Egyptian army continued their advance up the hill, the chariots hanging around on the flank, to which the Spartans and Dimas moved to intercept, and were quickly sent fleeing. The two lines of spearmen engaged with each other, the Egyptians at a clear disadvantage, being exhausted from their climb, and soon enough most of the Egyptians were broken and routing. With the field now filled with running troops, Dimas took chase, moving from unit to unit and eliminating them, until the last man goes down. Dimas took fewer casualties this time, and a majority of the Egyptians' forces had been eliminated, but it was the end of the line for the elephants. This time, the animals could not be recovered. The army of Jerusalem had finally been defeated and the city was now under Greek control. The massive population was not too pleased with this change of ownership, so Dimas had them exterminated. To the north, the British once more lay siege to Campus Yazagas, and another suitor was ejected due to Drillmaster. This time, the British had brought a more suitable army, bringing a lot of swordsmen and an accompanying force with warband. 
In Jerusalem, Dimas began rebuilding his own army and placating the huge city. To the north, Epigeus makes it to Mazaka, ready to start building his own army. And in Campus Yazagas, Ducetius rises once more to defend his home from the British. Three units of militia cavalry raced from the city gates and began to chase down the fallen back Brits. The Cretans once more on the walls, picking off all they could reach. They threw their javelins into the backs of the elite men. The militia continued their rampage, slamming into the swordsmen's backs once they had run out of javelins, taking down the British units one by one, until they finally escaped at the edge of the map. The British retreat, Ducetius becomes a confident commander and replaces a unit of peasants for another unit of militia cavalry. The start of the winter of 212 BC brings not only snow but another besieging British army and finally a suitable betrothal shows himself, young and having himself a good set of traits. It feels a shame that he will only garrison cities. The Britons appear to have gone back a step by bringing a lot of chariots, but at least this time they brought a general. A nearby assassin attempts to take out Quintvar, but ultimately fails in the end. If one agent can't do the job, perhaps another can. A local diplomat sidles up to the general and offers a deal that Quintvar just wouldn't be able to refuse. For two-thirds of the Greeks' treasury, Quintvar would change faction and his army would scatter into the wilderness. The Greeks weren't using their money for much else and agreed to the deal. Quimphar was a decent commander, if a bit paranoid from previous assassination attempts. He heads for a quincum to take up residence and hopefully increase growth. He is forcibly stopped by a small Briton army and finding himself quite undefended, Quimphar recruits every single mercenary that he can. That Britannia army would probably make good practice and a good test for Quimphar. The new general had the strength advantage, but his entire force consisted of mercenaries, and the Britons had some heavy hitters on their side. The Sarmatian mercenaries tried to loop around the back of the British line to take out the chariots, but the combination of the trees, arrow fire, and being surrounded and behind the enemy line was too much. So when they came into contact with the chariots, they broke. With the Sarmatians down, the Britons began to fall back and leave the battlefield. Sensing their opportunity, the Greeks threw money charged from the tree line and into the backs of the retreating Brits. Kinfar continued to slam into the Briton units until the call surrender was given, which he ignored and continued to slaughter the running men. With the battle over, he continued his journey to Aquincum, as well as becoming a superior commander, as well as gaining himself a shield bearer. With the population and infrastructure of Hatra sufficiently built up, Aemnestos was happy to leave and head south towards Palmyra. In the summer of 211 BC, he almost finishes his journey, coming to a stop just outside of the city. From the port of Antioch, a fleet containing Xanthippus and his army heads for Cyprus and the city of Salamis. The force made landfall and Xanthippus laid siege to the city, building his three rams. To the north, Campus Yazagas was once more under siege by the Britons. It wasn't a surprise to find it was the backup army from so many sieges ago. Four units of militia cavalry chase the Briton army across the field, firing javelins and then charging into their backs as they leave the battlefield, surrounding and taking down the men unit by unit, killing just over 1,000 men in the end. In the winter, the rounds for Salamis were ready, but they were not necessary for the spies had done their job well. The forces of Salamis and its reinforcing army would not be a challenge at all for Xanthippus. The militia cavalry race through the open gates and towards the plaza, and form up around the Nubian spearmen that defended the city. A brave horseman rushes ahead of his cohort and tries to take on the spearmen himself, but the spearmen have an advantage against cavalry and the brave Greek man goes down. The rest of the militia arrive on the plaza and the javelins tear the spearmen apart and when they run out of their ammunition, they charge into the weakened men, defeating them and starting the victory timer. The gods be praised! The enemy general is dead! His men know their doom approaches! Orders completed, Commander! The reinforcement team decided that the best gate to enter through was the one in front of the Greek army. 
As such, the archers were happy enough to prevent the Egyptians from making it to the city. Sanfibus takes control of the city and exterminates the unhappy populace. To the east, Amnestos was ready to capture his city as well. The forces of Palmyra had increased, but not with anything substantial. Nothing more than mere speed bumps. With just two volleys, the Cretans were able to remove the eastern infantry defending the western gate. With them gone, the Spartans began the advance into the city. Backed by the archers, the Spartans plugged the end of the street, the Pontic faction leader charging right into the line of spears and throwing away his life. The Pontic army flees and the Spartans follow. They halt once more at the end of the street and allow the Eastern infantry to throw themselves onto the Spartan spears. Spartans eventually cut down most of the infantry and work on mopping up the stragglers. With the loss of just one man, Amnestos captures Palmyra and enslaves the contend population. The summer of 210 BC was uneventful and the season passed with little trouble, though with the coming of winter the Egyptians decided to thrash the Greeks navy. An Egyptian army attacks a convoy of peasants heading for Palmyra, they were able to get away and the Egyptians didn't follow. To the north, the Spanish had seen the Greeks splashing the cash around and wanted in. For a measly 18,500 denarii, they'd stop the war, but considering at this point they had been a minor annoyance, that ceasefire did not seem worth it. And another suitable husband is accepted into the family. Idaeus had joined with Xanthippus and would now be the governor of Salamis, while Xanthippus returned to the mainland. From Azaka, with a newly trained army, Epigeus moves south, ready to join the rest of his family. The peasants made it to Palmyra, and Aemnestos was able to leave the city. He hires a unit of Bedouin archers, and with a spy now within its walls, he heads for Damascus, pushing an Egyptian army out of the way. His forces were unable to make it to the city, though. In the summer, Aemnestos laid siege to the city surrounded by Egyptian armies, and the gates were open. Hey there guys, thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, consider leaving a like or even commenting down below. I hope the wait between the episodes has been worth it, and I'm going to say that the next episode is most likely going to be the last one as well, hopefully without the over a month wait though. Thank you all again for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye!